Uh, good morning. Um, this is uh, the day after a day when the recording for <coughs> our Bible study group and prayer meeting uh, went awry, and so I'm redoing it again um, so that no one necessarily misses out. Um, the audio recording is available on the website milkcalvaryswansea.com um, for those who want to hear the original. Um, the notes are there as well if you can click through to soundfaith.com um, on the links on the website. However, I wanted to produce this for YouTube as well so that uh, no one can miss out um, unnecessarily. And uh, yeah, so this is the third instalment of Understanding Our Faith. Um, it's about general revelation again this morning. Last time we uh, started to look at this. Uh, general revelation is God revealing himself to all people in all places in all times um, uh, and last time we found out that God reveals himself through creation itself um, that night after day day after day uh, day night after night day after day God is revealing himself there's no place where the creation cannot be seen and known it is revealed to all people um, and because of the wonderment, because of the power that must have uh, been exerted in producing the universe um, and the intricacy, the design, um, this shows that there must be a God. Well, there is something uh, else uh, that the way that God reveals himself. He reveals himself to us through our inner being. Um, there's something in us that says that there must be a God because that's be why because we are made in the image of God um, there's an inner sense that he exists um, and Ecclesiastes 3 11 says that he has put eternity in their hearts so that means that we have a sense that there's something bigger than us larger uh, greater uh, so someone said that um, it, it's a God-shaped hole. Um, and then there's another part to that. Um, there's another sense, a moral sense. Uh, it's is, is what it, we call our conscience. Uh, it gives us an awareness of what is right and wrong. Our consciences, though, they didn't become active until after the fall in the Garden of, Ad uh, Garden of Eden. Uh, Adam and Eve, um, they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. Before that, they were innocent. Before that, they had no idea what evil was. They, it wasn't. It, it never crossed their mind. It never. Uh, it never came across their path. But um, the moment that they ate the fruit of this tree, which they were told not to eat, uh, in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. And surely their spirits did die within them. But they gained a knowledge which wasn't theirs to have, uh, which was the knowledge of good and evil. It wasn't necessary for them to know these things. However, uh, that didn't turn out that way, unfortunately. Um, but what happened is that the moment they ate the fruit, they, they had to go and hide. Um, they, uh, they were ashamed. They knew that something had gone wrong and that they were the cause of it. This innate awareness is also written of in uh, by Paul in Romans 2, 14 and 15, where it says, For when Gentiles who do not have the law by nature do the things in the law, these, although not having the law, are a law to themselves, who show the works of law written in their hearts, their conscience also bearing witness, and between themselves their thoughts accusing or else excusing themselves. Um, the thing is that uh, we have in us a knowledge of what is good and what is wrong. And we continue to do these things um, regardless. And one day when we are before God, we will have to give an account of all those things which we've done. When, like, it doesn't matter where we're, we... Um, we no try to keep the commandments of God. We can't even keep our own commandments. We can't even keep our own standards. And there's, uh, the standard within us is saying that something that we are doing is wrong. 
Well, unfortunately, this is what's going to cause us not to go into heaven. We will be judged by the light that we have received, but that light is going to reveal that we are worthy of judgment. And there is only one escape from that, which is through Jesus Christ, by faith in his name. Uh, um, he is the only one who can bring forgiveness. He, he is the way, the truth, and the life. No one can come to the Father except through him. But this is about our consciences. Our consciences, um, they, they are pointing the way to the fact that there must be a God. There must be someone who is a lawgiver. But our consciences, of course, they're not right. They can let us down. Sin has corrupted it, defiled it. It is, for some, some, some people have, have lost it altogether. Uh, it, they have they have suppressed it on and on and on and eventually it's, it's just not working anymore and um, but where did this sense of right and wrong come from um, we can learn what is right and wrong from others like our parents um, from from others who we associate with um, but it's already present within us um, and if we were taught that, for instance, that uh, that stealing was right, and we've been taught that all since the time that we grew up, there will still be something within us telling us, well, that's just not right, it's something wrong about that. Um, but this reveals to us that there is something bigger than us, something greater than us, that there is a law giver. Uh, uh, but of course our conscience does not give us a full picture of God, but it does reveal that there is one to whom we must give an account. There is that sense that we have to, we are were, we were going to be judged for our right and wrong. Well, a third way that God reveals himself is through history. And um, I, I find this a uh, very exciting subject. Um, his hand is is seen in the rise and fall of nations, controlling and guiding the seeds of history. And if we study history, we can see that this is the case. Well, Psalm 75 says this, but God is the judge. He puts down one and exalts another. And throughout scripture, we can see that it's the way God has worked. Uh, and we can see God's dealings with certain nations, such as Egypt and the judgments of Pharaoh. Paul says of Pharaoh in Romans 9, 17, For this purpose I raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. The whole reason why Pharaoh was uh, in power for such a time as he was, was so that God can reveal himself. And then we've got the book of Daniel, uh, a, a fabulous book. Um, uh, I know there's lots of arguments about the date of it, but uh, it's... It's clearly written um, in 650 BC, um, and the book of Daniel is absolutely full of the fact that God controls history. Um, and in Daniel, Daniel 5 is a good example of this. Belshazzar the king made a great feast for a thousand of his lords, and drank wine in the presence of the thousand. They brought the gold vessels that had been taken from the temple of the house of God, which had been in Jerusalem. And the king and his lords, his wives and his concubines drank from them. They drank wine and praised the gods of gold and silver, bronze and iron, wood and stone. In the same hour, the fingers of a man's hand appeared and wrote opposite the lampstand on the plaster of the wall of the king's palace. And the king saw the part of the hand that wrote. Then Daniel was brought in before the king. Then the king spoke and said to Daniel, Are you that one, uh, that Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, whom my father the king brought from Judah? I've heard of you that the Spirit of God is in you, and that light and understanding and excellent wisdom are found in you. And you have lifted yourself up against the Lord of heaven. You have brought the vessels of this house before you. you <clears throat> and you and your lords, your wives and your concubines have drunk for wine from them. And you have praised the gods of silver and gold, bronze and iron, wood and stone, which you do not see nor hear nor know. And the God who holds your breath in his hand and owns all your ways, you have not glorified. You see, God is holding the breath of all of these people, including us, including Belshazzar. Then the fingers of the hand were sent from him, and this write, writing was written. And this is the inscription that was written, Mene, Mene, Teka, Parson. And this is the in interpretation of each one. Mene, God has numbered your kingdom and finished it. And notice it's repeated, which is always for emphasis. Because if something is repeated in, in scripture, it means that this is... Uh, confirm that this is going to happen 
Um, tekel, you have been weighed in the balances that found wanting. Perez, your kingdom has been divided and given to the Medes and Persians. Then Belshazzar gave the command and they clothed Daniel with purple and put a chain of gold around his neck and made a proclamation concerning him that he should be the third ruler in the kingdom. That very night, Belshazzar, king of Chaldeans, was slain and Darius the Mede received the kingdom, being about 62 years old. So, uh, I hope that uh, you know something of the story of Babylon. Uh, a city that was thought to be impregnable, invincible, and unconquerable, which is why Belshazzar was having such a party, despite the fact that there was an army encamped around him, uh, that the Medes were outside the front door. And they were right, the city could not be overcome through the city walls. Though it was so wide that you could have a two-lane motorway, or freeway if you're American, on top, it, it's just not, it wasn't possible, it's such a wide wall. Um, but the Medes were very clever, they redirected the flow of the Euphrates River so that they could pass under the water gate and take the city, and then did that without a fight. And this is something that God ordained to happen. One ruler was, broken down, was brought down and another took his place. Well, notice by the way that Daniel was made third ruler of the kingdom. And for many, many years, people say, oh, Daniel's got it wrong. You know, Belshazzar was never king of Babylon. He was never king of the Chaldeans. Except the history has borne out the fact that he was actually co-regent with his father when his father went to convalesce um, and, and to recover from a, a sickness. Um, and so there was Belshazzar, and that's why Daniel was made third ruler of the kingdom, because he couldn't be second, he was third. Yeah, that makes sense. Anyhow, um, then um, we, if we go on further in Daniel, we're told about four kingdoms, the Babylonians, which were the present power in David's, Daniel's day, and then the Medes and the Persians came as we, we read Belshazzar um, was um, killed, and uh, Medes and Persians, the Greeks came after that, and then the Romans, and Daniel predicted them before they were. Um, and even if we want to put a, a late date on Daniel, we struggle when it comes to the Romans. Um, and of course, he speaks of another kingdom yet to come. Um, and it, it will happen, because God has said it will happen. <clears throat> anyway, it's um, God has allowed these kingdoms. He, they were ordained by God. And he's allowed them even though they're, they're ungodly. Was it Habakkuk that said that, uh, that um, yeah, Lord, why are you raising up a, a more evil nation to come and conquer us? And, um, and it was a mystery in those days why such, such nations existed, why there are uh, people who uh, run like North Korea and so on. We don't always know the answer to these things. Um, but it's the same today. When we look at the kingdoms of this world, one is raised up and another is put down. It's all in God's hands. And I, I'm always you know, amazed at how certain people come to power and authority and then others just simply disappear from, the, from history. Well, we can speak of British history and the miraculous sinking of the Spanish Armada in 1588 or in World War II, how we were saved from an invasion because of a series of mistakes made by Hitler and by the captain of a German ship called the Bismarck which was sent to destroy the food convoys, without which the British cannot, could not survive. And if the ship had not been sunk by the British for, in revenge for its attack against the British flagship, the HMS Hood, America would not have joined the war. And then would Britain liberate, liberate Europe? This was a, a, such a crucial event in 1941, it can only be seen that after the war, that this was the pivotal point that changed the outcome of the war in Europe. And it, though, of course, it went on for another four years. Um, and God did not allow Spain nor Germany to take over Britain, partly because we put our trust in God and because there was a call to national prayer in both of those occasions um, that the, the Queen or the government asked uh, the people for prayer. And they got it and they received it. It changed the events of history. And we can find similar stories even in British defeats. Uh, the US is a good example uh, with other nations and with interventions that only God could do, raising up and putting people down uh, in authority. Uh, and this is how it is throughout all the nations of the world. God is in control, God ordained them to their positions and one day another will replace them. Uh, no, 
this is remember I uh, this 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 uh, what I have written here what I wrote four or five years ago uh, I can't be very more precise than that I don't think but um, and I was looking over these notes last week thinking okay so I need to change this or adjust this and of course I did some editing because it's it's right for my church here in Mount Calvary, Mount St. Swansea, uh, where I'm the minister. Um, but I left this part in, and I, I said, Note that the world cannot depose someone like Robert Mugabe, though they dearly want to. And the thing is that he will remain in power until God says he shouldn't be. And it may be, with what we're hearing on the news, uh, that Robert Mugabe will no longer be in power. But maybe he will. It's only until God says. And then whoever takes over from him will be because God has ordained it. Really important. When we look at the nations, we, we've got to be careful about how we judge. Uh, Trump has come to such a time as this. Theresa May is for such a time as this. You know, it doesn't matter what our politics are. What, whether we agree with either of them or agree with them fully. The thing is that God ordains people into positions of authority. And that's why elections are interesting things. Like, uh, like well, why didn't Hillary Clinton win? She was the odds-on favourite. And yet Trump came to power. Why? Because God made sure. Now, that doesn't mean that uh, that uh, Trump is God's man, you know, that he uh, has better Christian values than Hillary. No, it's, God has raised him for such a time as this for a particular purpose. And, well, maybe it's to raise America up, make America great again, or maybe it isn't. Maybe it's the opposite. I, well, I'm not the judge of that, and nor should any of us really be that. History will bear out what is uh, what is the real result of people being in authority um, and occasionally we have weak leaders um, and, uh, and they just kind of muddle along um, and uh, God has ordained it for a, a particular purpose maybe it's for judgment maybe it's for blessing um, and maybe God is just simply working out his whole plan who knows? We don't always know the answers to why certain people are in positions of authority. North Korea is a good example. Kim Jong Un. No one can do, defeat him until until God says, oh, so it says, well, yes, now is the time. There were many assassination attempts on Hitler, and none of them succeeded. He actually took his own life in the end. Well, you know that wasn't how. Uh, why? Why did God allow the man to live? Well. God knows. God is the one who's in control, and uh, and well, it doesn't mean that we can't um, have a different political view or press for uh, what we think is right, um, to press for righteousness, to justice, and mercy. Um, but let's let's be careful. Um, scripture says, "Speak evil of no one." We're not called to do that, even of politicians. We're not called to speak evil of anyone. We are called to hold people in respect who are in places of authority. And and Paul said this when uh, Emperor Nero was on the throne. One of the worst emperors that ever existed. Who killed many Christians. Anyway. So, a nation can only take over another kingdom if God allows it. Otherwise we have to stay within our boundaries, which are set by him. And there's nothing we can do to change it. But God allows sometimes... A, boundaries to be a bit fluid. Deuteronomy 32 says when the Most High divided their inheritance to the nations, when he separated the sons of Adam, he set the boundaries of the people. Acts 17 26, he has made from one blood every nation of men to dwell on the face of the earth and has determined their pre-appointed times and the boundaries of their dwellings. See even their times, how long they shall be a nation, how long they will be within these particular borders and so on. You remember, uh, we are talking about the way that God has revealed himself to all people. This is We're talking about general revelation here. Um, and I've not yet mentioned Israel, a nation that should not exist, uh, didn't exist from 130, 135 AD when the Roman Empire finally 
um, destroyed all the Jews and uh, took over. And um, but then in May 1948, it became a nation again, fulfilling many different scriptures. But for example, Isaiah 66, uh, who has heard such a thing? Who has seen such things? Such a land to be born in one day. Shall a nation be brought forth in one moment? For as soon as Zion was in labor, she brought forth her children. And nothing the surrounding nations or the UN could do anything about it. That though on the day of independence, six nations attacked Israel. And what did they have for defense? Just a couple of jets and that was it really. But God miraculously helped Israel to defeat them. See, it doesn't matter that Palestine, the Palestinians, uh, the Hamas or and Iran say, well, we don't like Israel, we're going to push them into the sea. Have they achieved it? They have not achieved it. What they, Israel is a blight to them. It shouldn't exist. Well, God says it should exist, and that's the end of the matter. Uh, history proves time and time again that there is a power at work in the lives of people that cannot be put down to mere chance, who directs the ways of people, direct, raising up unknown persons to, people, uh, to be people of power and putting down those who are in power to become nobodies. And some end up in jail, some are killed. That's how, how it is. <clears throat> the evidence is plain that there is a God at work. History is one of the ways God reveals himself to the world. Again, this is not, neither of these ways that I've spoken about today uh, is enough to know God personally or to save someone. But we should recognize these things, even as non Christians. And it, it should set in us, I think, well, God. It would seem to me that there must be a God. He, there's a creator. There is somebody who is, must have a moral code who's given us the law. Uh, I have to give an account of myself one day. And, and history. How can we explain the things that happen in history? Like, there's a real mystery why why certain uh, certain um, groups come to power. You know, nobody expected the Conservatives to win in 2010. No, in 2015, no one expected it, but it happened. Why? Because God said, this is now. Now, it doesn't matter what our politics are, what we view of these things. Um, so, but, <clears throat> whilst, uh, whilst all of these things are true, uh, it's only in the preaching of the gospel that people will come to faith in Christ. Uh, God has revealed himself for the wonder of creation, the innocence within human beings and the course of history. And God willing, we'll move on to our next session, which will be God revealing himself so that we can truly know him. And I um, hope that you will join me for that.